Um, well, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Andy Lowe. I'm the executive director of the Elios Foundation. So thank you for um, coming here to be with us this afternoon. Um, we're very honored to have two fantastic uh, speakers, panelists, to be able to talk with us. Um, as many of you know, there's a, the main event is taking place at 3 o'clock. It's being organized by Arts and Lectures just across in Campbell Hall. And Dambisa will be talking about her latest book, How the West Was Lost There. So the focus of this afternoon's event here um, with the Elios Foundation is to talk about the book Dead Aid. Um, hopefully many of you received a copy of that book uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, we had a small army of uh, interns who are running around Santa Barbara trying to make a number of uh, old and newer friends to pass out the book. So hopefully you, you all received a copy of that book. If you don't, we have a number of copies at the back. Um, one of the best books I've read in the last two years. I haven't even bribed him and he's saying <laughs> <laughs> and, and so we are trying to kind of uh, read it as much as we can and we're also trying to kind of be educated on it. Um, this event is purely educational. It's not going to be any pitching or any uh, pressure to get checkbooks out. It is purely educational, but the idea and the, the role that Elios is trying to have for these educational events is to get people excited about these opportunities that there are to make a difference in the developing world and not just leave people hanging with that excitement, but to also say, here's some opportunities for people to get involved. So that's one of the reasons that we're delighted to have a, a real life African <laughs> entrepreneur with us. Uh, and so um, Chid will be talking about kind of the work he's doing as well. Um, just a couple of practicalities. There's a lot of materials that we have at the back. So on, all, on your desk, we have a communicate on your chair. Sorry, I'm not going to speak in a, a school. Um, <laughs> on your chair, we have a communication card. The idea is if you're willing to put your name in your email, um, we think that's the best way that we can track who actually turned up from the RSVP list. So even if you have RSVP, if you already have that, if you could just put your name in your email on this, then we'll collect up the cards at the end. And then we're not having that awkward, did we see you on Sunday conversation, because we'll know that you were here. So that's on the back. Um, there's a couple of other things that I'll mention again at the, a the end. Um, but we are having a book review uh, session on Monday, February the 28th. So for those of you who would like to meet to discuss more in depth some of the things that are said today, and then to read some chapters and some sections of the book, um, we'll be having an in-depth in discussion then. Um, that's based up at the Enios Foundation at 801 Ladera Lane. Um, the next event that we're doing in partnership with Arts and Lectures, again, is on April the 25th. Um, so there's a flyer there, Dr. Sen is coming. Um, so if you're interested in coming to that event, then you'd be very welcome. And then there's three different investment opportunities that Elios is involved in um, that are at the back there. So you're welcome to take these different ones that are kind of outlining these opportunities. So um, maybe I should start by giving a bit more of an introduction to who Elios is. Uh, and then I'll let the speakers kind of run wildish. Um, so Elios's focus is on market-based solutions uh, in the areas of health and education in the developing world. So we, we deploy and invest capital in the range of 50 to $250,000, um, very early stage uses of capital so that we can get entrepreneurs up to scale so that the bigger investments can come in. Um, we closed down our first co-investment deal uh, in September, October time and that was in a for-profit company in India um, that was investors coming in, a 2% return over three years in a for-profit company that provides safe drinking water uh, and telemedicine in rural communities in India. So the belief that we have is that these opportunities are some of the most exciting ways to be able to make a difference in the developing world. Uh, and like I said, Elios is putting in the hard work of finding these opportunities and then is trying to build a community of co-investors here for the good of the world um, to be able to make a difference in, in the work that you're involved in. Um, so during the course of this year, we'll be presenting a number of other opportunities. So I will be sending that on to those of you that are interested. Um, and then um, myself, and then at the back, there's a gentleman, uh, John Duffy, who's just joined us at the Elios Foundation. He's the director of the Strategic Partnerships. So he'll be helping to follow up with a number of you to kind of talk, talk you through that. Um, the last introduction I'm going to say is Jim Villanueva, who's also at the back. He's the director of investments at Elios. And so if you're interested in finding out more about these investment opportunities, then do please speak to him. So the format of this afternoon's event is that we'll have a 45-minute uh, discussion uh, that I will be facilitating here from the front, so I'll be asking a number of questions, and then we'll be opening it up for questions from the floor. Um, we will be filming the first 45 minutes, and so we'll be asking certain questions that are on camera, and then we'll be turning the cameras off at the end of 45 minutes so that we can have uh, open questions. Uh, and and real be, answers. <laughs> <laughs> it won't be recorded forever in a day. 
Um, and like I said, there'll be a number of follow-up opportunities. Just a few thank yous that I want to say thank you to Roman. I don't know if you're here yet, Roman. I can't see if you are. But thank you for Roman to helping to pause together. And thank you for arts and lectures. We're really pleased to have this opportunity to work with you. And thank you to the interns that were running around this week and have been running around for the last couple of months helping to pull this together. And then thank you to these two speakers. So, um, so my background is in international development, so I've worked in a number of different opportunities in the developing world. and always been struck at the amazing opportunity there is to make a difference, but always incredibly frustrated at the challenges that there are. And the challenges that often come from the Western world as much as there are challenges on the ground. So when I was uh, reading your book 18 months ago, uh, I was so excited that somebody was saying lots of the things that I, I was thinking, uh, obviously articulating a lot better than I would have done. Uh, and while, as we said earlier, while I wouldn't necessarily agree with everything that you've said in the book, um, I do like, uh, do agree fundamentally with a lot of the underlying premises. So maybe, Dambisa, you could start off by giving some background on, on who you are and what's kind of been driving some of your philosophical views. Well, first of all, thank you very much um, to everyone for being here. Uh, I have to say I was slightly worried and, and my expectations were heavily managed by Roman who I still don't see in the, in the room yet um, because I know it's a long weekend and I, I know it's a Sunday as well. I was just saying it's quite sacrilegious that we're all here and not in church, but <laughs> never mind. Um, but I just wanted to say thank you very much for being here and I really hope that this ends up being much more of a, a dialogue as opposed to a, a, a sort of preachy lecture. Um, <clears throat> The reason I wrote Dead Aid, and actually also the reason I've written this next book, How the West Was Lost, um, is because, in, in, in essence, these are appeals to reason. Um, I'm appealing to people's reasonableness, um, rationality, um, a good old-fashioned uh, common sense, which I fear uh, has been lost, um, and very often driven by what I would call, and what I've called in both books, unintended consequences. So good intentions that lead to uh, bad outcomes. Um, and certainly in the context of, of uh, Africa in particular, but developing the developing world in general, um, my strong belief is that we actually know how to create economic growth. And remember, you know, we're living at a phenomenal time. We have witnessed countries like China and India and Brazil, even South Africa on the African continent, do the phenomenon. They have moved hundreds of millions of people out of poverty in a very short span of time. So, and we know that these countries have not relied on aid to the extent that African countries um, rely on aid uh, today. And yet, we don't pause to, to stop and think, why is it that we're continuing to pursue a policy uh, very aggressively, I might add, by some people, um, to give more aid to Africa, when we know that that is not why it is that China and other countries have emerged. China now the second largest economy uh, on the planet on a GDP basis. <coughs> um, but more than that, we also know that it's not aid that has made America great or uh, European countries um, as advanced economic economies. Um, and if you just look at the statistics across Africa, we're talking about a billion people. Um, there are actually more poor people in China than there are in Africa. Uh, more poor people in India than there are in Africa. But somehow, there's a psychology associated with Africa which I think has become so, so damaging um, and over the past 60 years has kept us, um, held us hostage um, to um, sort of truths and truisms that are actually not that. There are um, ideas such as uh, aid being a solution for alleviation of poverty um, that have no evidence in fact or in logic or, you know, or certainly in, in evidence. Um, and so the, the reason I've, I've written, I wrote Dead Aid and I've written this other book is because I believe that people want to do well. And I, want, I believe that people want Africa and Africans to be equal partners on the global stage. Um, but at the same time, we really have to be honest about, uh, and in, in, a, in a sense humble about what we can and what we should be doing um, in these emerging markets. And I'll just end up by saying also that um, you know, the discussion I hope we have today and, and really the discussion in my book is, is aimed at being much more nuanced. When, I say, when we say aid, um, you know, the question is what type of aid are we talking about? We're not talking about humanitarian aid. I mean, clearly if there's a, a, a disaster in Haiti or in, uh, Katrina strikes or <coughs> in Pakistan you've got floods, I mean, I think it's a, there is a moral imperative for us to act as human beings. So that's not the type of aid I'm talking about. And nor am I talking about NGO aid which, you know, I think, as I said earlier, we must be uh, much more humble about our expectations of what that type of aid can do. You know, sending $20 for uh, a well to be built in Zambia or $20 for a girl to go to school in Kenya or whatever. 
Um, that's all laudable, but the fact of the matter is we need to be much more humble about really what that can do in terms of meaningfully putting a dent in poverty and really you know, jump-starting economic growth, which, by the way, the, the United Nations says we, we should be aiming for around 7% uh, a year economic growth. And the fact of the matter is African countries, um, fall, many of them, fall short of that. Um, so the aid that I'm really talking about uh, is this, these larger billion-dollar aid packages that go to Africa every year, uh, mainly from government to government, but also from the big development agencies um, to Africa. And um, you know, there are a whole host of problems that come from that, and I'm sure we'll come into that in a moment. But I mean, I think in essence, it's, as I, you know, I start ending where I started off by saying, you know, we're reasonable people. You know, we have um, hundreds uh, of years of, of evidence on what drives economic success, be it in the U.S. and Britain, uh, across Europe, and now in what's happening in, in uh, many places around the emerging world. Um, and you cannot have a society where there's sort of two speeds, where we have one, one policies of economic development for China and India and, and so on, and a completely different policy of, of development for Africa. I mean, why should there be these two, um, two different strategies? Um, particularly since there is no evidence anywhere um, that we can meaningfully reduce poverty and cre create sustained economic uh, growth by relying on aid to the extent that African countries do today. Great, a lot in a lot in that opening opening bit. We'll come back to that in a, in a second. Um, <laughs> no, it's great. That's great. Thank you, um, Chid. Maybe you can uh, help set the scene a little bit more as well in terms of telling us a bit more about your background. Um, I've just said that you're a real life African entrepreneur. African entrepreneur, yeah. I also maybe don't you can know if there's that a little bit more. Yeah, if there's too much after this to say after that uh, introduction. Um, but uh, I couldn't uh, agree with Dr. Mario anymore. I mean. This, uh, uh, at the age of uh, 30, I went back to Liberia. I'd been, uh, my family had been exiled from Liberia since 18 months, and, or since I was 18 months old. And I went back uh, because I was specifically interested after seeing uh, the election of uh, Africa's first female president, uh, President Sirleaf, and after seeing this amazing women's movement that had you know, worked so hard to create peace, I, I was interested in going back and doing something in economic development. And as I sort of, you know, surveyed the landscape of, you know, starting nonprofits to build wells or to do this, or uh, uh, going back and starting a microfinance bank, um, you know, I just started reading all the top economists, and you know, I've looked at examples of China since 1982 pulling 500 million people out of poverty. I looked at Vietnam that was able to cut their poverty rates from 1993 to two, to 2002 by 50%. And uh, none of that had anything to do with microfinance or had anything to do with aid. And, and what you know, they did was they built factories, they put people to work, and they gave people the dignity of work. And so uh, as I surveyed the landscape, I thought, all right, well, that seems like an interesting idea. Like, what could we really do? And uh, I remember I was actually reading Jeff Sachs' The End of Poverty at the time, and he was talking about how beneficial that working in factories was to women in China, how they were something like 80% less likely to have five kids by the time they were 20, and how uh, they were sending you know, um, money back to their family in the villages and helping to sustain all types of uh, a larger family. I thought, hmm, I wonder if that would work in West Africa and Liberia. And uh, after looking at some things that were set up for us, the short shipping routes, the, the, the low wages that we had there, and of course this amazing trade legislation called the GOA, uh, which allows for duty-free imports of uh, cotton goods, uh, textiles, and apparel into the United States, the largest market in the world, I thought, well, this is pretty obvious. I mean, we led an industrial revolution, uh, you know, in the 1600s in Western Europe. We did it in the United States, and you know, we've seen it happen. How you know, our grandparents worked in factories in uh, New York Garment District, and they were able to send their kids to school, and then their kids went on and became professionals, and that's how a lot of us are here today. So I really imagine the same future uh, for people uh, in Liberia. And so uh, last year we started what is the first fair trade certified uh, factory in West Africa. It's partially owned by the women that work there. We make apparel for uh, retailers in the United States. Uh, our first uh, major shipment uh, happened just about two weeks ago for Prana. A um, uh, 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 Southern California based retailer, we made uh, their first fair trade certified t-shirt. 
and uh, we're scaling up pretty quickly. We have about 40 uh, employees now scaling up to 900 uh, in the next 18 months, uh, as long as all of our investments come through, hint, hint. And <laughs> You're very subtle. <laughs> You know, we're really looking to see uh, this movement grow throughout West Africa. We see this amazing opportunity uh, for West Africa to be looked at and, and for the whole problem of poverty to be looked at through the eyes of production. We've looked at, at the poor as consumers, whether it's consumers of aid or consumers of credit or whatever, and I think that there's this great opportunity now for us to look uh, at West Africa specifically as, as producers and people who have a competitive advantage in some areas and really work you know, with uh, government, with uh, uh, um, the NGO sector, uh, and with private enterprise really as the engine to fuel um, the end of poverty in Africa. Great, and again, we'll come back to kind of understand more about the business model shortly. Um, I'll be so unpack on what you said about appealing to reason and uh, common sense. Um, could you give us kind of a brief snapshot of your bio as to how you built up your common sense over the years um, based from your African birth to where you are today? Sure. So um, I mean, I guess uh, it's, I, I find personal stories not very exciting, so I'll keep it quite short. I think you're very interesting, so please feel free to. I mean, maybe I should start at Jersey Shore and then... <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, so no, I was um, born in Zambia, uh, Southern Africa. Uh, it's a small landlocked country. Uh, I think uh, sort of the, the upper estimates are we're about 15 million people, probably more around 10 to 12 million people, uh, said landlocked. Former British colony was called Northern Rhodesia. Um, I was born to two people from two different tribes, two different parts of, of now Zambia. Um, and my parents, uh, very fortuitously, um, were, the, were two of the first blacks that were allowed to go to university in Zambia. Um, and so um, they met and married um, while at university, and I was born uh, just you know just before they graduated. And um, uh, you know it was it was sort of 1970 coming into 1970, so civil rights movement in the United States. And my father got a scholarship to come to California. Actually, um, was at UCLA, and then uh, did his PhD in uh, Madison, Wisconsin. And um, you know if you, if you can imagine the time, I mean this was at the time when Africa was. Africa uh, as a continent was uh, becoming, was decolonize, decolonizing many countries, becoming much more independent to the 1960s, coming into the 1970s, and there was so much euphoria uh, about going home. And, you know, even today, um, you know, when I talk to my parents and to people of their generation, um, it was just not even a debate about whether or not they were going to go back to Africa. It was a no-brainer. You know, they came abroad, they loved living in the United States, but after their degrees, everybody was racing home because there was so much excitement about what was going to happen. Um, there was a lot of expectation, self-governance um, for the first time, uh, post-colonial period, a lot of expectation about economic growth, um, about what, what Africans for the first time could do for their own future generations, their children and their children's children. And so really the part of the reason why I wrote uh, a large chunk of the reason I wrote uh, Dead Age <coughs> was that, you know, we fast forward and I, I actually went to the same university my parents went to uh, mm -hmm. years later um, in Zambia and um, uh, the university was closed down because of an uh, attempted coup um, which, uh, as, as a very good friend of mine says, yes, every self-respecting African country has to have some kind of political crisis. Um, so Zambia was not, uh, did not escape, unfortunately. We had a, a coup attempted coup. Um, but the point being that, uh, you know, when you look at the, sort of the past 30 to 40 years, it's basically been um, a, cat you know, a, a categorical disappointment. Um, Paul Collier, who uh, was my PhD supervisor, um, wrote a fantastic book called The Bottom Billion. And uh, he talks about how Africa is shearing off from the rest of the world. So you're seeing economic growth and all these amazing statistics of, you know, the poverty being cut by half. China now lends to the United States. You know, you see serious uh, improvements in education and so on. In Africa, you know, we have per capita incomes worse than they were in the colonial period. Um, you know, in 1970, 10% of Africans were living on less than a dollar a day. Today, 70% of Africans live on less than two dollars a day. Um, you know, uh, life expectancy has, has come down over this period. In, in Zambia, uh, aside from HIV, AIDS, but also infant mortality, uh, life expectancy is 38. 
Um, I mean, this is completely unacceptable. Um, and at the same time, you know, over a trillion dollars of aid money has gone um, to these countries. So, you know, what kind of system is it that is allowed to perpetuate for 60 years um, with very poor results, where we're rewarding bad behavior? You know, some of these, it's shocking, and I'm sure we will get into this some more, but just go across the continent. There's still presidents who've been in, in power for 30 years. Um, you know, some of them even longer, who've been in office, supported by the international community. Um, you know, Egypt is a classic example of this. Um, but what kind of system, why should we not ask, what kind of system is it that doesn't deliver economic growth, doesn't reduce poverty? Politicians are rewarded for staying in office, you know, even though they're not doing the right thing. But we continue to push this idea of aid, even as I said earlier, we've got no evidence that providing aid in this uh, these amounts actually works. And and this is why I've been driven to this. I go to Africa, um, you know, uh, when, I'm, when I'm not on the road, um, um, you know, in places like Santa Barbara and, or, or Shanghai or wherever, um, I go go to Africa, someplace in Africa, once every six weeks. And uh, I've, I've been very fortunate to meet many uh, African heads of state, good, bad, and ugly. Um, and, uh, you know... Can I ask you when we turn the camera off? <laughs> yes, I mean, you have to, I'll tell you. <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I mean, the first thing I've said to them, for some of the countries I hadn't been to before I finished uh, Dead Aid, um, but I've said to them, oh my God, just as well I didn't come here before I wrote the book because my book would have been even more scathing. Um, but it's even, some of the, another, one of the presidents said to me, you don't have to be so completely rational. People paint African presidents like they're idiots or come on, somehow clueless. He says, we're absolutely rational. You know, we get paid to do nothing. You know, why should I be running around the world uh, trying to talk to hedge fund managers or pension fund managers to invest in my economy when I know all I have to do is pick up the phone and we'll get more aid? And, even, and in fact, which is worse than that, if I can show that I have more poverty, more disease, more political instability, I get more money. And I was like, what kind of a system is this? But this is the reality that we live in. And really, um, the background, I know my parents, um, um, the background in the home that I grew up in you know, was, was to question the obvious. And to me, this is obvious. And when people say, oh, dead aid was so controversial. No, it wasn't. It's absolutely obvious that this, we're doing something wrong here. And it's, it's time we take a step back and support people like this. So we better raise some money here. Okay, so I'll I'll come back to you with with the next question. Um, I was obviously in preparation for today, rereading and rereading your book, looking at kind of a few other opinions that are out there in cyberspace, for, for better or worse. Um, and I wanted to kind of just go through a few bits that you mentioned. I I think you've made it quite clear, kind of your underlying premise about aid. Um, if we are looking for a new way of approaching things, uh, and we being the world as opposed to just Westerners or, or Africans, yeah. if we are looking for a new way of approaching things, how do we deal with some of the practical issues that have in some part led to the behaviours being like they are? So the first question I was going to ask you was kind of about the corruption challenges. You mentioned that a number of times during the book, and you mentioned kind of the major issues that are around corruption, again appealing to what you just said about the rational uh, rationality of why people are doing things the way that they are. If we're looking for a new way of doing things, how do we address corruption? Is it is it as bad as everyone thinks it is in Africa, or would you think that's not necessarily fair? And how can that be addressed with something like Chid? Like we'll ask yeah. Chid, kind of give some practical examples afterwards. So um, I would say, as I said, there are about a billion people in Africa. Um, the sort of bad news is that uh, although we're very different different places, Chid is from West Africa, I'm from Southern Africa. It's completely different um, in terms of. Uh, historical context uh, in terms of the, the sort of uh, cultural makeup. I mean, there are lots of different differences, uh, but the fact of the matter is that we are painted or tainted by the same brush. Mm -hmm. um, and in the book, I called the Four Horsemen of Africa's <coughs> Apocalypse. Um, you think Africa, you think disease, poverty, corruption, um, and uh, uh, civil unrest. Um, and so, you know, it matters uh, tremendously what's going on in Liberia for what's going on in Zambia, because for most people, Africa is Africa, it's all a blur, and it is tainted by these, by these things. Um, to your specific question, uh, you, you know, if you look at something like the Transparency International Index, which comes out once a year uh, in the autumn, I think it's in October, 
um, they go around and they have this thing called the Con Corruption Perceptions Index, and they basically rank countries all around the world on who's the most corrupt, who's the least corrupt. Um, we like it or not, the majority of African countries are at the bottom. Um, and, and to me, uh, I strongly believe that it's, this is an artifact of the aid system. Um, in, not in, in its entirety, because there are countries that are very heavily oil dependent, for example, that also have high corruption. Um, but certainly, a lot of countries uh, in Africa are, are, are very heavily corrupt, and I would argue that a lot of that corruption emanates from these billions of dollars that come sitting into these, flying into these countries that we know um, are stolen, misdirected, and, and so on. But I, would, I think the to focus on corruption alone, and it's a serious problem, is sort of to mask the more fundamental problem with the aid regime, which is the following, which is that this idea of throwing aid money um, to political leadership in Africa, not only when they don't deliver on under or reducing poverty and creating growth, but you're, you're giving them money, you're rewarding them for doing bad things. So, you know, if they did, if they did nothing, that would be, that would be one thing. Mm -hmm. But the fact that they're doing worse, they're doing bad, doing ill, makes it even a, a more uh, sort of objectionable proposition. But the fundamental problem with the aid system is that it severs the link between the individual on the ground, so people like me, like Chid, um, and our ability to hold our governments accountable. Um, so let me just take a moment, if you wouldn't mind, and just give you an example of how, how you live in the United States. You have a democratic contract which you hold sacrosanct, and the idea is very simple. Um, the US, <coughs> excuse me, the government taxes you, and in return, the government agrees to provide you with what in economics we call public goods. Uh, they provide you with education, they provide you with health care, they provide you with infrastructure, they provide you with national security, and they provide you with an environment to incentivize entrepreneurs to do business, to create economic growth and so on. What happens if the government doesn't deliver? So let's suppose you have dilapidated infrastructure or um, people are upset because there's not enough good education. Well, you go to your booth in a ballot and you vote the government out. That's how it works. Um, and that is the sort of sac sacrosanct or sanctity of a, a contract, a democratic contract, that doesn't just hold in the United States, it's across Europe and many other countries. Now think for a moment of how it works in a place like Africa, where we, not just Africa, but many other places in the world where we ostensibly have democracies, but I would argue that many of them are actually illiberal democracies. So you still have a lot of uh, women are suffering um, under <coughs> despots, um, and not just women, but uh, men as well, um, but also journalists are threatened and so on, so illiberal democracies. But the contract that I talked about earlier between the individual and the government, that contract of democracy, is actually severed by aid money, because that aid money basically encourages very rationally African leaders to spend their time not courting the taxpayer, forget about the taxpayer, courting and catering to the international community who have a whole different agenda for why they give aid. Come hell or high water, doesn't matter if African governments have more poverty, we'll just keep giving them aid. So you sever this contract and we on the ground in Africa are unable to hold our governments accountable. That is the root problem for the aid system. Everything else falls out of that, whether it's inflation, the debt burden, the corruption, the political infighting, because everybody's trying to become president so that they can put their snout in the trough. Um, all of that emanates from the fact that we are simply unable to hold our governments accountable when they do not deliver on this suite of public goods. Okay, I'll come back to that one shortly. Um, just on the corruption issue, Chith, um, can you give some examples of how you have handled <coughs> that as an entrepreneur working in, in, in Liberia? Yeah, absolutely. I think um, <clears throat> this was obviously a, a large fear uh, going back to Africa to work because anybody that you talk to about doing business in Africa, the first thing they say is, how do you get around corruption? And uh, I'll, I'll be honest, uh, a, as we were, um, you know, I think rightfully very scared of it, in Liberia we haven't found many cases 
of, of, of true corruption. Of course, there's a system uh, generally of tipping people in Liberia. Like, it, it, even if you're going to a government office to get a driver's license, you know you give this person $3 and $4. And so I hope that's not what anybody's talking about when we talk about <laughs> corruption, because if you do that, we're just going to have a ridiculous conversation. But um, I, I, <laughs> I will. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Um, I will talk about um, a specific case that happened to me a few days ago. We were going to clear a package coming in from Morocco. I uh, needed to get it out quickly. It was about, uh, you know, I want to say $30,000 worth of uh, uh, material uh, coming in for the factory. Uh, we, we went there. This guy thought he was trying to help me, of course. So he says, oh, $30,000, you're going to pay almost $6,000 of duty on this, right? I said, no, no, I'm not, because I know the laws pretty well. I'm not going to pay GSD. I'm not going to pay so on and so on. He says, oh, well, come to my office, blah, 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 blah. So he takes me to the chief collector at the airport, and he says with this guy, yeah, you're going to owe $7,000, but pay us $3,000, and we'll just let you go with the boxes, right? And I thought, oh, my goodness. Not only are you a criminal, but you're not a smart criminal, because I knew, <laughs> I knew that really the price of clearing these goods was going to be something like $1,200. And so the, the fact is I had to drive back into town Mm -hmm. uh, uh, talk to the, the head of the commission's office who wrote a letter explaining that I didn't have to pay GST and so on. I had to make about two or three trips. And it wasn't so much that these guys were, like I said, just trying to be criminal. They just didn't understand the laws. When I went back the second time, I took them the new regulations under AGOA that they needed to study um, because that hadn't been disseminated to them yet. And I took them, you know, uh, the manufacturer's <laughs> license that says you don't have to pay certain taxes. So, so there is just a general general issue of capacity and of, of, you know, these guys, you go into an office, for instance, to clear goods in Liberia right now, and nobody has computers. And, and you literally get a, a woman or a man with a calculator, and, you know, they look at your invoice, and they literally write your bill down on a blank piece of paper. And, you know, there's no way that we would find that acceptable in Santa Barbara. And I really hope, as we really start talking about corruption, I come out of Silicon Valley in the tech world, you know, this would be solved with a computer system. I mean, you put it in that somebody comes in with an invoice, you plug this in, it shoots out exactly how much they owe in duty, end of question. But with all the aid money going into Africa, unfortunately, we don't have money to put computers in at customs. I mean, it just doesn't make a whole lot of sense. So um, I would say we've run into a lot less of a problem with over corruption, definitely never at the senior levels of government. You'll get, you know, a, 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 a little guy at a front office who's looking for his Christmas, he'll, he'll, we call it in Liberia, or just like a small gift when you come to see him. Uh, but my hope is that, is that truthfully we get to a point where we're using technology to completely eliminate um, a lot of the question in terms of how we calculate things like taxes and customs and so on. Um, so coming back to you, don't be some building on that question is, um, and I'll ask you a number of questions on this to kind of get some more practicalities about kind of next steps. If you were whoever you need to be president of, whatever you need to be president of, World Bank, US, Zambia, whole of Africa, whatever whatever political position you need to be in, what would be kind of the major changes that you would roll out um, based on kind of what you've been saying about the, the aid trap um, and based on kind of the, the actual practical challenges? So if you were in the position of authority, what would kind of be the top few things that you would be rolling out? I'm just saying as a sort of lone ranger, not a position of authority. I'm, I, I apologize, <laughs> I will make my words clearer. You're a very influential person in an elected position of authority. I guess at the macro level, I, I think when I travel throughout Africa, um, there's a lot of low-hanging fruit. Um, and by that I mean, things that could be changed tomorrow. Really, it doesn't need another report. It doesn't need another woman with, uh, an African woman with a baby in her back and a pot on her head looking like, you know, she's struggling to kind of get to our, our pull out our, our heartstrings. We don't need any more of that. We know what the situation is. Um, there's some very basic things, and some countries are doing it. Things like cutting back on public expenditure. I mean, some of the waste that is going on in Africa is outrageous. Um, even in Zambia, for example, um, the fact that our ministers can get health care in London or in South Africa, uh, I think is outrageous. And I think people like President Kagame in Rwanda has banned it. He said, if you're the Minister of Health in Rwanda and you get sick and you say, oh gosh, 
excuse me, um, the Rwandan government has to pay for me to go to London to get a health check. There's something wrong there. That means you're not doing your job. So, you know, we have to actually, just basic stuff like that, cutting back on public expenditure. Um, but also, it's about empowering Africans. You know, um, somebody said to me, and in one of the, the biggest, one of the big three development agencies, a very senior person, um, I'm sure you'll be able to figure out, um, you know, by, by, by those clues, said to me that um, out of 50 odd countries in Africa, there are only two countries, and I think my guess is probably South Africa and Botswana. Um, there are only two countries where the international community feels comfortable for the African government to write a report on any key sector, education, healthcare, infrastructure. Now, I'm sorry, but as a, as a Zambian, um, my country gained independence in 1964. I think this is absolutely outrageous. You know, what have we been doing for all this time if out of 50 countries, only two countries, can a government write a report on education or healthcare? Um, we've got doctors on the ground. We don't have as many as we would like. But if you're not going to listen to African doctors or African teachers, or even, for example, myself, who went to school, primary, secondary, and university in Zambia, if you're not going to ask me what it's like to be a girl in primary school in Zambia, then what are we doing? I don't, I don't understand what the whole purpose of this is. So at a macro level, I think we need to actually empower many more Africans, but I think fundamentally we've got to get around to this idea of, of really getting policymakers, both in the international community and also in Africa, to accept and understand that aid is not an open-ended commitment, that we've got to start having a discussion about how and when we're going to wean African countries off of aid. I didn't say five years. I gave it as an example. I said, what if? What, would, what could it be like if we were to wean Africa off of aid? But we've got to actually start having that discussion. And obviously, it's not a blanket policy. Countries are at different levels of economic growth. But you know, to quote President Kagame, you know, we all in Africa, we always thought that that's what the whole point of aid was, that the most successful aid was the type of aid that wouldn't need to exist forever, that you were, it was really a hand up to help us to get past a certain point. But the fact that people, you know, I get pilloried and people find it outrageous that I say we should have a discussion about weaning Africa off of aid, I think it really goes to the heart of this issue, that we psychologically uh, have convinced the world and Africa that aid is something that is an entitlement that it will be around forever. And uh, given the vulnerabilities of do donor countries, I think it's something that's wrong. Uh, but more practically, on, on this point of what other things can be done, Obviously, I'd like there to be a, um, a reduction in, in corruption, and I think you could get that if you, you said we're going to get off of, of this aid thing. But also, um, there are basic things like credit ratings, which are, you know, like credit ratings are for the individual, credit ratings for countries are very important. They are a signal to the marketplace, to international investors, that governments are serious, that they're willing, and that they're able uh, to pay back monies, even if they don't borrow, it just is a is a it's a sort of a, a figure of uh, uh, or a picture of uh, of um, of seriousness. And out of fifty odd countries, only around fifteen countries have credit ratings. To me, the World Bank and IMF should do nothing else this year but encourage African governments to get credit ratings, not to go out and borrow, but just to, uh, to be able to signal to the international community, I'm a single B or a double B or a single A country, and therefore I have my books in order. But the fact of the matter is that they don't have credit ratings. And I think that is, is, is one thing. Another thing is that uh, every year the World Bank puts out a survey called the Doing Business Around the World Survey. Um, and here they rank countries all around the world, which countries are easy to do business in. How easy is it to get a business license? How is, easy is it to get credit? How easy is it to hire people? So on and so forth. Consistently, majority of African countries are at the bottom. It's a nightmare doing business in many countries. I mean, there are countries it takes two years to get a business license in Africa. Again, why are governments in Africa not incentivized to create environments that people want to go and invest in and, and uh, actually invest in, or even domestically, to grow entrepreneurs? Um, why is it the case that these places are such a nightmare to do business? And to me, the reason it's like that is because these governments know they can get money elsewhere. They're going to get money from the aid industry, and they can stay in office. I mean, without the aid, they would have to grow these economies. Otherwise, they wouldn't be able to stay in office. They would need to find some way of financing uh, their stay in office. And then the last thing I would say is that you need regional integration. As I said to you, I come from a country of 10 million people. With all due respect, who cares? 10 million people, big deal. Big, it's not even a real city in China. 
in the cities in China and Asia. I mean, go to Asia, it is mind-boggling. You know, South Korea, 16 million is in a, is in a city. Um, and they, they have to provide infrastructure for all these people. We're failing to create economic growth for populations of 10 million, 6 million in Africa. It's outrageous. So I think you need much more regional integration. Uh, as I said, Zambia is about 10 million people on its own. Southern Africa is 200 million people. It's a completely different proposition, much more of a network. I think it's a bigger market for investors. And also, you don't just there's no need to get hung up on nationalism and all this stuff if, if you're living in, in dire economic um, poverty. So those are the kind of things I would think about yeah. doing. I, and again, I don't think it, it's particularly rocket science. This is what America's done. You live in the United States of America. It's, you've regionally integrated. You focus on, on you know, transparency, you get your credit ratings. You, it's just basic stuff. Um, and it's a pity that people just don't seem to want to do that. So similar question, but on a more uh, micro level. Um, <laughs> as an entrepreneur, how are you able to kind of make a difference in this space? Maybe give some examples of Yeah, <coughs> well, um, as I was just listening, uh, uh, a story came uh, to mind. Uh, last weekend, I was with the uh, US's ambassador to uh, Liberia. and. Uh, I talked about how we just did the first shipment under African Growth and Opportunity Act, which allows us to ship uh, garments and textiles uh, to the United States uh, duty free. Um, now, uh, to, to, to do garments and textiles, you need to get a special apparel visa. So you need to go through a completely different system that you get approved by the US Customs Bureau, the Trade Representative, and Liberia's Minister of Commerce in order to show that you're not going to do illegal transshipments, for instance, you're not going to import shirts from China and then send them duty-free directly to the United States. Um, no African country had gotten this done in less than six months, and we got it done in Liberia. So I went to the ambassador and I said, thank you for all of your work making sure that we got this shipment done under a Goa. And she said, why? You did all the work. I said, no, no, no. I mean, you had to wrestle the trade representative and you had to wrestle the minister of commerce. And she said, no. See, we could get it done. We've just never had an entrepreneur that, that incentivized us to do it. And so as we're thinking about all these things that need to happen in Africa, and as we think about what really drives a lot of political change here in the United States or in Europe, right, and it's really having this business community that's saying, no, this is what we need. And really putting the pressure on the, on the politicians. As uh, Dr. Murray was saying before, what does the government, when has the Liberian government ever been accountable to a small-scale entrepreneur like me? Uh, you know, maybe they're accountable to Firestone with a large concession or to a, a metal steel or somebody, but really they've never had to collect taxes from somebody like me. And, I, and, and um, you can tell right now that there's a huge shift going on with the Sirleaf administration. President Sirleaf has been in our factory, I think, three times in the last two months. Uh, she was just there last week. She actually put me, named me by name in her State of the Nation uh, the other day, and I got to stand up in Parliament, which was a pretty uh, great honor. But it's just been so encouraging for them to see an entrepreneur come back and, and create a new industry in their country because, you know, before that, the only way that it happened was having paying some, no offense, American a college grad to write a policy about what if we could start a, a, a textile industry in Liberia. And you know, we'd spend $100,000 on that, but we wouldn't spend you know, 100000 bucks actually starting the factory. And I think that that's, <laughs> that's the shift that we need to see now. Instead of you know, writing reports about reports that other people wrote, let's actually get into <laughs> gear and start creating jobs and start creating this tax base that'll uh, create an accountable government. So I'll ask one more question for each of you before we uh, open it up for the questions from the floor. So if you want to be thinking away about uh, good questions to ask. Um, and this is about practicalities of how we as Mr. Smith or Mr. Jones or whoever it is here in Santa Barbara, how can we get involved in, in making a difference? We've been very excited by what you've been saying, we've read the book, we agree with you. What do we do now? Okay, so I mean certainly at the macro level, uh, I think there's a lot of things that uh, individuals can do. Uh, and, and, and I'm really saying this here because um, across, there are many Africans who share my view, many who don't, um, but I think that many Africans, are, for the reasons we've outlined here, don't have the um, strength and the power to really, as I said, we said earlier, hold the government accountable. So that knocks, <clears throat> knocks that group out. Um, <clears throat> Western governments and African governments, or I should say donor governments and African governments, are kind of stuck in this weird symbiotic relationship. Western governments want to win votes from you. Um, they know if they, somebody stood up tomorrow and said, look, we want to support Africa, um, and we think that the way we should support Africa is to 
and create, you know, support to entrepreneurs. We're going to cut back on aid over time. Don't get worried. You're not going to turn it off. But we're really going to just, over time, scale back on aid and really invest in this. There would be outrage. I mean, there are people who absolutely think that aid is an entitlement and it would be completely unacceptable. And so Western policymakers are largely motivated by votes, very rationally, and so they don't do the right thing there. African governments, um, many of them, not all of them, um, are motivated by taking free money. Free money uh, is actually, I, I, I can just imagine, it must be sort of a laugh to many of them, saying this is completely, must be a joke. We keep getting more money. We have people r running around writing our reports for us. We don't have to do anything. Um, and even the best and most truthful African leaders um, are encouraged to abdicate their responsibilities. So it's not just about these venal, greedy ones who are stealing. Even the good ones are not encouraged to build up capacity locally. They're told, don't worry, we're a USAID or we're British DFID or we're CEDA or whoever, we'll write the reports for you. You sit back and relax and we'll fund them and we'll, we, we'll, we'll create all this employment. So again, African governments, I wouldn't hold my breath. So it's really, to me, up to you guys to do something. And it comes back to your question, what could you do? At the macro level, call your senators. You know, they need to support AGOA. Everything that Chida said here is true, and I've talked about uh, uh, AGOA in the book, mm -hmm. but the problem is it's very narrow and it's very, very small. This is cotton textiles in Africa. Cotton is not the only thing that's going to get Africa growing at 7%. We need to export agriculture produce en masse. So good start, but it's not good enough. We need a lot more of that. Um, some of the other things that you could be doing, I actually think are, are great uh, investments, and I've invested myself in Africa, things like microfinance, which at an individual level, I think um, you could actually have some impact. Um, there's a great, <coughs> excuse me, a great um, platform called Kiva, K-I-V-A, out of, um, I think it's out of San Francisco, if I'm not mistaken, um, where you can give as little as $25, and it's not give, it's lent, and it's entrepreneurs, and people are giving them to their kids now um, as Christmas presents and birthday presents, but it's encouraging this whole culture of lending, repayment, which I think is very important. It's the backbone of America. It should be the backbone of, of any developing region, including Africa. So I think that's something you can do. And there are lots of other things that I think people should be aware of. Um, but the last thing I would say um, is really, I think what Africa lacks the most is ambassadors. Ambassadors to talk about the wonderful things that are possible uh, on the African continent. Um, the next time you switch on the television and you see an, an advertisement with another African child who is desperate and hungry um, and impoverished, you should be outraged because they're using African children to raise money. There are serious problems there, but that type of thing is not, it not only is it damaging for the African psychology, no investor is going to go rushing into Africa with that type of a background. And as I said to you earlier, India's got more poor people than Africa. When is the last time we saw an Indian child on, on uh, American television? China has more poor people than Africa. Again, when was the last time we saw that being used as a crutch to display or to, to reflect a, a society? This is not just about economics, it's also about a psychology that we have to change. And I really hope that, you know, having met Chid in particular, I mean, I can talk, but he's a doer. I hope that you go out there and say, you know what, I think this perception of Africa is not entirely correct and really challenge your policy makers, but also take that extra step to try and find out about some of the entrepreneurial things that are going on in the continent. That's a great segue to the last question for you. Cheers, the great entrepreneurs make a difference. How can we <coughs> um, Where are you at with your business? Uh, well, yeah, I mean, obviously our business is a great way to get involved. <laughs> <laughs> uh, uh, we're uh, just uh, beginning to raise uh, uh, our second round of capital. Uh, in equity and debt. Uh, a lot of it will be used to expand our operation in uh, Liberia and hopefully into some other uh, neighboring and regional countries, uh, Ghana uh, in particular. Um, but, you know, I, I really look at Africa much differently than I think a lot of people, number one, uh, being a kid and uh, my dad was Liberia's ambassador to Germany at the time, our uh, largest trade partner, so I always sort of saw this uh, uh, Liberia to me as this amazing place with, with a wealth of opportunity and I, I you know, living there over the last uh, few years now, um, that's even come into the front of my mind again, you know, sort of getting over the horrible picture uh, that Dambiza keeps talking about that we have of Africa. You know, I have friends that are running uh, businesses in Liberia that are making 
really amazing returns. I have uh, friends that are running uh, at purely Africa investment funds that are doing 20% a year. There's some really amazing investment opportunities in this global economy. In fact, I know a lot of people who are strictly investing in Africa right now because that's where the growth opportunity is. Um, so I hope that we can absolutely change our mind a bit uh, towards what's really going to affect poverty. Don't get me wrong. Absolutely that there are problems. Absolutely we want to increase um, uh, access to health and education in particular. I, I uh, was talking to somebody the other day and they were talking about sending more kids to school in Liberia and I said, well, what's the point if we're sending them to crummy schools? You know, I want to see us make the, the right types of investments uh, that will help strengthen and, and uh, make sure that in 20 or 30 years all reports coming out of Africa will be written by Africans. But I think really it's, it's very clear that the engine of that growth is going to happen um, in the private sector and in, in providing jobs, specifically in our case, jobs for women. We know that if you, you know, give a, a, a woman work, if you basically allow her to raise her family out of poverty, um, she's going to invest in things like education and health care. Um, all of the women in our factory, you know, last month was uh, the beginning of the second term. So all everybody was talking about was school fees, how their entire savings was going to be wiped out for the, for the last six months because they got to pay school fees. And I don't think we'd have the same, uh, uh, the same results if we were working in mining, for instance, where it's very male dominated. You know, the women come to work and they're very heavily focused on their children. Um, so I also agree that I think the answers are, are right there in front of us. Um, and, and that if we can do anything that we can to really grow the spirit of African entrepreneurialism, um, that we uh, will hopefully see the end of poverty in my lifetime.